series called This Is Us. Um, it's a little unique series for us here at City Church. Ordinarily, uh, we make our way through um, a book of the Bible or a section of the Bible or a theological topic um, in the Bible that we open up the Word of God and make our way through. Um, this is a little bit of a unique series for us. It's just kind of a recapture of why we're here, why the church as a whole exists. We call it the Big C Church, the global church, everyone that knows Jesus and professes Jesus, this global church, and then how that breaks down in these local kind of small C churches, these little local gatherings that we call churches like City Church, these local expressions of the Christian faith, and how do these big global uh, Christian beliefs translate down into small churches that how do we keep the main thing the main thing and keep focused on uh, the main stuff and so we have said um, each week that there's a purpose uh, for the church to exist uh, there's a purpose for city church and so we've just kind of been breaking down what are our four core values and how they um, come out of scripture and and how they uh, kind of break down into our everyday lives as a church I was actually looking at some of the more uh, popular and well-known corporation uh, mission statements this week um, to kind of see how they define um, their purpose. And I found some interesting ones. Um, Walmart's uh, mission statement is saving people money so they can live better. And then the rest of that is while also wearing pajama pants in the store. So that's kind of kind of a cool add-on to the Walmart mission statement. Um, Apple products, Apple says, bringing the best user experience to its customers through its innovative hardware, software, services, and always listening to your entire conversation and thoughts, devices that they put into your pocket. That's their mission statement, to listen to everything you have to say. I made up that last part, you realize, right? Um, Facebook, Facebook is to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. And the rest of their statement is like, while never having to be true friends with anyone, you can just have them on your list, right? Facebook friends. Disney, to be one of the world's leading producers and providers of entertainment and information, while also charging you a fortune to come to one of our parks, right? Google, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And they did have a little disclaimer down there. It was like uh, we actually Googled our purpose statement on Google. Um, Starbucks, Lacey got that one. Starbucks, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one neighborhood, and one $15 cup of coffee at a time. <laughs> Nike, bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. If you have a body you are an athlete. And if you do not have a body, you are not an athlete, is the rest of that purpose statement. The mission statement of City Church is very simple. We've said it week after week. We'll put it on the screen for you. Um, City Church exists to continue what Jesus began. Uh, that Acts 1-1 is that uh, Luke says that we, he's continuing to teach what, what Jesus started back in the Gospels, that what Jesus began, the rest of that story is what the church does, that we continue what Jesus began. And then from that mission statement flow our four core values that keep us laser focused on the mission to which God has called us, which is to continue what Jesus started. And so week number one, we talked about core value number one, which is our most important one of all. And core value number one is... Core value number one is the, the church belongs to Jesus. Good job. Uh, we start with that, that Jesus is the head of this, it's his church, uh, that we are following him. And then last week we focused on core value number two, which is grace is a way of life. Is there a cheat sheet up there? No, there it is. Uh, core value number two, grace is a way of life. As we begin to understand the gospel, we understand the grace that's been given to us, that grace becomes our life rhythm, that we are people of grace, preaching and living a gospel of grace. And then this week, we're going to focus in on core value number three uh, for City Church, which is we live intentionally in community. We live intentionally in community. Say that with me. We live intentionally in community. Say it again. We live intentionally in 
community. Now, I know community, again, one of those kind of Christianese words that we, we love to use, that we do not always uh, know what it means, um, right? I've always kind of poked fun at those. Um, Dan Morrow was up here a few weeks ago and made a reference to one time I made a joke about uh, the hedge of protection, that we tend to pray for the hedge of protection. I just always said I didn't really know what that meant, like that there's some bush or some piece of shrubbery that's supposed to protect me. Like I was more for the steel wall of protection and not the hedge of protection. So like I don't even know where that phrase come from, but now since I said that like, I don't know, 17 years ago, Van brings it up every time. Yeah, anything to say, but the hedge of uh, protection, and also a little lingo that we use while we're praying. I don't know where it always comes from. You ever heard when you pray that we always say, uh, Lord, bless this food and the what? Hands that prepared it. The hands that prepared it. Like, why are we praying blessing on hands, right? I got some blessed hands that prepared this food. These are some blessed hands. Uh, but then I, I always love how we pray over food, and we use this phrase. No matter what we're eating, we pray, God, bless this to the nourishment of our bodies. Now, I know I'm about to put 5,000 calories of just straight sugar and ooey goodness into my body, but Jesus, please bless this for the nourishment of my body. I'm about to take down a triple bacon cheeseburger that could give me a heart attack, but God, bless this for the nourishment of my body, right? We got to get rid of the guilt when we're about to eat and consume that. So we're trying to pray nourishment. I don't think God still works those miracles. Like, that's a has been, right? And so we pray these prayers. We use this lingo. And community is one of those words. Um, communities, basically, it's translated according to kind of how you understand it. For some people in our culture, uh, community is kind of this deadpan comedy series that happened a while back that was kind of like but not as good as The Office. You know what I'm talking about? The community comedy series that came out. A lot of people, it just means the neighborhood they live in. I live in a community. And maybe if you live in a planned community, it may involve the HOA. Is there anybody in here that is a member of an HOA board? Let's, let's stop and pray for Alan right now. <laughs> Alan's like every HOA board member I know. He's proud of it too. He's like waving his head like, me, it's me, it's me. I'm the one, I'm the one that's making you um, get your little building you put behind your house approved uh, before you can put a building on your own property that you bought and paid for, right? And so that's what people think of when they think of community, kind of a planned community or something like that. We Live in community. Now, if you use that phrase around people who um, are not familiar with uh, what it means to be in Christian community, they may look at you like you dropped in from another planet and smile politely and hope that you change the subject. Um, and then we use phrases that don't help it, right? We're going to be in community and live in community. And again, just kind of how people think. It's like, what are you going to sell everything and, I don't know, move to a compound in Vermont and wear overalls and raise your own vegetables and build a bunker and believe conspiracy theories. Like sometimes these are things that we think about uh, when we use words like community. But what community means in the faith is just kind of simple, raw, basic doing life together, that we do life together. And it's built on this idea that we share a common faith in Jesus, that we live a common life in community because of a common faith, a common belief in who Jesus is, what Jesus has done. And community is simply living that out, living out this common faith that we share in Christ. And we believe that community is part of God's relational design for us to live full and meaningful lives as followers of Jesus. It's this idea of community is grounded in um, who God is, that God has eternally existed in community, in relationship, that the very core doctrine, one of those center circle doctrines, one of those closed-handed issues of the Christian faith is that God is a trinity, that is Father, Son, Spirit. We just sang about it, and that those three persons exist in eternal community with one another, and that when God created, that he created relational beings that are created and designed for community. We talked about this 
um, extensively in our image series at the very beginning um, of, of 2023. If you weren't here, that's a great series to go back and listen to. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? Um, Genesis 1:26. God said, let us, there's that idea of the Trinity, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, there's that relational idea. Male and female, he created them. So this idea of being created in God's image is that we, we reflect, part of it is that we reflect the relational nature of God, that God created us in community and for community. As a matter of fact, if you read in the creation account, uh, when Adam is all alone, um, God gave all the animals and he realized, and like, that's not enough, right? That, that Adam needed to have another human being. Uh, matter of fact, I always get cracked up at the phrase in Genesis um, that the text says that it was not good for man to be alone. Like, is there any truer statement in all of the world than that? It's not good for a man to be alone. I'm a terrible alone person. Anybody else? I'm a terrible alone person. Now, now you, if you know me well, you know that that doesn't mean I want to be like in a place with 500 people in the life of the party. It just means like I want my wife home. I want my kids around. Like I'm a terrible alone person. Like Ash will go out of town uh, to the beach or whatever with some girlfriends for four days. And you would think like it was the end of my world. I'm all miserable and acting all short with her. Like, well, why do you get to take a vacation and I don't? Um, and the real reason is like I'm just a terrible alone person. And it's not good for man to be alone, literally. After all, if man is alone, if a man is alone, like, I don't know, who's going to tell us what to do? <laughs> who's going to interrupt my sentences if I'm alone, right? Who's going to finish my sentences for me when I'm alone? Who's going to help me find a gallon of milk sitting wide open in the fridge if I'm all alone? And I'm standing at the fridge like, where's the milk? It's like center shelf. Right there, Devin. Like, who's going to do that, right? Just kidding. That's not what that phrase means. Uh, but it's not good for us to be alone. It means that we are to live in relationship. Like, living in relationship is part of our creative design. Now, here's the conflict with that, living in a broken, sinful world. Conflict, particularly in our culture, is American culture pushes us toward isolationism. It pushes us toward individualism. A lot of our kind of founding documents have to do with this idea of rugged individualism. Like it pushes us away from community and toward individualism. Here is the sad reality about the, the current um, time that we live in. We are the most connected yet disconnected age in human history. The most connected yet disconnected age in human history. You've got instant access to people all over the world. You've got instant ability to connect to the amount of information, to just this, this infinite amount of information and knowledge is at our fingertips at all times. Um, there are people that you can know through kind of cyberspace that are literally around the world that you can connect and find out about them and be connected to them in some way. And yet our hearts and souls are very disconnected uh, from not only God but from the world uh, in which we live, the most connected yet disconnected age in human history. I mean, we live in a close-the-garage-door culture, don't we? Like that we pull into our neighborhoods and we pull into our garages and we close our doors. I don't want to call people out, including myself, but, I mean, if we were being honest, there's probably several of us that have lived in particular places for extended periods of time and really don't even know our neighbors. Maybe some that we've never even met, even though we live within yards of them. Um, or short distance from them. Um, we are very connected as far as easy access world, but a very disconnected day and age. Um, and community is essential to living out our faith. Did you know a healthy relationship with God includes a healthy relationship with others? That there's no solitary confinement option in Scripture. 
that we are created for community and in community. And that's why this core value is so important to us at City Church, that we live intentionally in community. It's even kind of built into our logo. You may not have noticed this or know this before, uh, but like even the City Church logo is this idea of the C. There's the two C's uh, which represent Christ and City Church, but you can see how all four of the, 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 the boxes which represent kind of the four areas of Decatur, um, they are intertwined together. That All of them come together uh, to form a connectedness. And so um, we're breaking down the logo for you this morning at City Church, but uh, the idea even built into the logo is that we are people who are created to live in community, whose lives should collide, whose lives intersect. So community, doing life together, sharing a common life in Jesus. That's not self-centered isolation, a refusal to invite others into my life. That's not just a superficial, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, kind of casual fellowship when we come to church, when nobody really knows who we are. The New Testament assumes The New Testament assumes that we live out faith in the context of relationships. One of the most repeated imageries of the church in the New Testament is the idea of family. That we are a family, that we are interconnected, a household of faith. Elizabeth read some of the um, texts this morning, Romans chapter 12, 4 and 5. Whereas in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we although many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Paul in Ephesians, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. There's our common faith. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, later in Ephesians, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. There's that idea of the church belongs to Jesus. For whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Um, As you know here at City Church, I often kind of take one text and just drill down into it. And like trying to find the text for this week's message, I realized like there is so much in the New Testament about this idea that it's hard to just go to one place and break it open. So instead, I'm like, we just need to understand the whole New Testament carries with it this idea of living in community. Did you know that there are over 31 another living ideas in the New Testament? Over and over again, we are instructed to do things for one another, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, um, admonish one another, greet, serve, teach, accept, honor, forgive, be devoted to one another, bear each other's burdens, accept one another, be at peace with one another, be kind toward each other, tolerate one another, be gentle toward one another, be hospitable toward one another. These are all one another texts in the New Testament that defines what it means to live in a community of faith. I mean, Paul even says in Romans, greet each other with a holy kiss. Like, who's, who's lining up for that one? Sheila Raines is gone today, or she might just add that to her repertoire. What's the point? The point is that we are to be invested in the lives of each other, that we are a family. We need each other. It is meaningful community, looking out for each other, holding each other uh, accountable, preventing each other from falling, uh, going through the ups and downs of life together. I have experienced in ministry that a disconnected follower of Jesus will usually not last very long. A disconnected follower of Jesus will usually not last very long because we need each other. Just the teachings that we've read this morning is this idea that we're a body and everybody has a part, every part comes together to form the body 
And so even that illustration right there validates that point, that you can't take a single body part and just leave it to itself without that body part eventually dying, right, ceasing to exist, that there's not a single body part that you have that can exist outside of the body itself. And so that's why that the New Testament is very intentional and specific with the illustrations that it uses is to emphasize this point. Now, let's talk about some obvious um, hindrances or obstacles to true community. I'll just mention a few here, and a lot of these apply to my life, and so that's why I'm sharing them with you. Um, a lot of times, these obstacles to true community, one, it may just be a lack of awareness, like you don't realize you need it or acknowledge the importance of it, so just a lack of awareness. Sometimes it's a fear of acceptance, and that's kind of twofold. It's a fear of accepting others. Now, there may be people involved in this community life that I don't like or I don't prefer, I don't get along with, and so maybe a fear of accepting others, but maybe more often it is a fear of being accepted. Like if they really knew me or were uh, understood who I was, that uh, I would not be accepted. So there's kind of this fear of acceptance. And then let's be honest, one of them is just busyness. No time to get involved. We talked about this a lot on um, this past Wednesday night in our group study on prayer, um, how busyness just stands in the way with relationship, relationship with God, um, relationship with each other. Um, the study that we're doing used this phrase. I thought it was a good one that captures this idea. And it's a very simple phrase, uh, but the phrase is just this, hurry kills love. Hurry kills love. Because love requires time, relationship demands investment, and hurry eliminates all that. And so hurry, busyness, crazy chaos of life hinders and kills relationship. Busyness. What about messiness, right? Let's be honest. People's lives get messy. Ours do too. We are broken people. City Church attracts a lot of people with messy lives and broken lives. Our story is one of messiness and brokenness that God has redeemed for His glory and purposes. And so we tend to attract people that have messiness in their lives and brokenness in their lives. And, and sometimes that's a little frightening or sometimes it's like the reality that other people's lives are messy. The good news is all of our lives are messy and broken and we all need Jesus. And so you're constantly surrounded by messy, broken people just like you um, who need Jesus. And then the last one I would say is just plain fear. The fear of acceptance, the fear of uh, relational intimacy, the fear of getting hurt, the fear of having to maybe share my feelings or share what's going on in my life. Like these are just natural fears. And I'll be the first to say, like, I get it. I get it. I have these same feelings. I have these same fears. I have these same struggles. It's why our core value is worded exactly like it is. Look at it again. We live intentionally in community. We implies more than one. We're in this together. Those who have received grace, right? Grace is a way of life. Those who have received grace, those who are believers in Christ, we, second word, live. That's everyday living. That's good days, bad days, ugly, ups, downs, hills, valleys. That is this on going idea that in the messiness, in the dirt, in the grime, in the difficulties, in the struggles, in the sickness, in the prayers, in all of life, like we choose to live. We live everyday life. It's not being removed from the brokenness of the world. It's not being isolated from it. It's not a bubble mentality. It is that we are living in the brokenness, that we choose to live everyday life that third word is a big one, intentionally. You have to choose to do it. You have to make an intentional effort to be in community, to make it happen. You do not naturally just fall into community. You choose to do it. Next word, in. We live intentionally in. That means together. We choose to be in community and not out of community. There's a lot of people right now that are professing the name of Jesus that are choosing to opt out. Opt out of community, opt out of church. Look, I get it. I get church hurt. We've all experienced that at some level in our own lives. 
I get the church makes a lot of mistakes at times. I get that people get wounded by the church. I get that there's times and seasons of people trying to figure it out. We always say here at City Church, if you're in that, that season, like know that this is a safe space to be able to walk that journey um, and for us to be able to encourage you and love you through your processing and your prayers and trying to figure it all out and the hurts and the wounds that go with all that. There's a lot of people that sit in these seats that have been through that. So I get a lot of people are opting out for different reasons. And so we have to be intentional to live in community and not opt out of it. And then that last word, again, this idea to choose to do life together because that's how God designed it. And so we use those words intentionally. We don't just say we live in community. We say we live intentionally in community because you have to be intentional to make it happen. Every primary thing that we are called to do as a church is to be done with others. Gather for preaching, others. Gather for worship, others. Participate in the sacraments, baptism, Lord's Supper, intended to be done with others. Fulfill the great command to love each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. That involves someone else, right? The great commission, go make disciples of all the world. That's other people. The New Testament picture is that we are unified in word and spirit, and it is all done in the context of community. Now, what we believe about community impacts how we make disciples. Let me explain that to you. This is so important. Many discipleship programs, this idea of becoming a disciple of Jesus, are um, they're, they're linear. And what I mean by that is there's kind of a step one, step two, step three, take this class, take this class, take this class, take this class. Then when you get here, then you're a mature disciple, right? And everybody, there's all these kind of paradigms that have been created throughout the modern church time. But most discipleship programs um, are kind of laid out that way. But here's what I've discovered in my life and a lot of ministry is even though a lot of discipleship programs are linear like that, uh, most spiritual growth is not that way. Most spiritual growth is winding and haphazard and curvy, right? There's this curvy path of growth that happens in everyday life. And it's kind of three steps forward, two steps back, and I'm in, I'm out. Like there's, there's kind of this winding path of spiritual growth. And I had a mentor one time that taught me this. And it's just resonated with me so much that most spiritual growth happens in two situations. It happens in need to know and need to grow moments of life. Let me break that down. Need to know, need to grow moments. Need to know. This means that as I'm living life, there are life situations where I need to know, I'm forced to know God's viewpoint about something. Man, this is becoming so vital in the day and age that we're living in. And what I mean by that is there's those like, what does the Bible say about fill in the blank? Need to know moment. This is a hot topic. This is a cultural issue. People are saying this. What about this argument? And in those moments, there's a need to know basis that often causes us to like go to the scriptures, to go to someone we trust, to read the word and to figure out what does God teach about this? What does God teach about sexuality? What does God teach about, right? Just just whatever is on the list right now in modern times. Another instance, like, Um, You don't really feel like you need to know certain things until there's somebody knocking on your door, right? A a Mormon's knocking on your door and pushing you on your face. And suddenly you're like, wow, I don't really know how to answer that, know what to say. So it forces you to go to the text. It's a need-to-know moment. And so there's these theological, biblical, ethical discussions that take place with family and neighbors and coworkers, and you're forced to need to know something. By the way, let me put an asterisk here. In those moments, in those moments, the best thing for you to do is not just Google or listen to your random friend down the street's opinion on something. The best thing to do is actually go to the text. What has the Bible taught about this? What has the church believed for 2,000 years about this? Uh, These are important sources to like need to know as we kind of navigate some really difficult questions in our modern time. So need to know situations. What about need to grow? You see, life is going to hurt you at times. It's going to stretch you. And life at times forces me to grow 
based on what's happening in my life at the time. Maybe I lose a job and I have financial struggles. Maybe I experience some level of loss, a death in my life or a divorce. Maybe a sickness occurs in my life. There are moments when life hurts and we are stretched and we are forced to grow in our spiritual lives. That faith and obedience tension that often exists that makes us stronger people after we come out of it. And so the need to know, need to grow moments. Now, I'm not opposed, if you know even how we teach things here, I'm not opposed to this kind of linear knowledge, what we talked about before, more, knowing more about God, understanding deeper about who God is. Like we need that knowledge. But I can tell you, linear knowledge, information, doesn't always prepare you for those need-to-know, need-to-grow moments. It is the difference in what's your, in your head and what's going on in your heart. That we are forced to lean into two things. We are forced to lean into the gospel, and we are forced to lean into other followers of Jesus. And that's important, other followers of Jesus. Again, not just random person that's got an opinion. But other people who are on this journey with that common knowledge of what we believe about Jesus, that common belief about who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. And so we rest in the gospel and we rely on others. And so fostering a life that provides you access to those two things, the gospel and other Jesus followers, is essential to your spiritual journey. Fostering relationships, growing a life that provides you access to the gospel and to others is essential for your spiritual growth. God has something to say about your life situations. So what we want to do as a church is put you in a context where you are close and connected to what God says. So we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to push you to the Bible. We're going to I say it all the time. If you're going to be at City Church for any, any length of time, you need this. We're going to preach from it, teach from it, push you toward it. We're going to draw truth from it, right? We're going to open it up, teach, preach it. We're, we believe it. And so we're going to push you toward the Scriptures again and again. So what we're going to do as a church, we're going to try to position you where you're hearing what God has to say. But we also are going to position you where you are living life with other followers, that you need the gospel and you need others on your journey in those need to grow, need to know moments that you are resting in the gospel and relying on other Jesus followers in the journey. I call it the Velcro principle. You know what Velcro is, right? A whipped out Levi's little wallet for this illustration, this little Velcro wallet, our favorite noise when it comes to Velcro. Ready for it? That's how you know it's Velcro right there, right? Got the noise. Now, why does Levi need, holy smoke, who's paying this kid? <laughs> Kid's doing some chores or something. It's mainly ones, thankfully. Oh, he's got a little debit card. <laughs> a debit card in his wallet. It's not real, it's not real. Um, but this is a little Velcro wallet. Levi needs it because every one of these dollar bills would be on the floor if he didn't have this to hold it together. But our goal as a church is to Velcro you to the gospel and to Velcro you to others because it's what helps keep your life together. It's what helps you stay intact, keep your life from being haphazard and overrun and those need to grow, need to know moments that we drop the ball because we're not connected to the gospel and we're not connected to others. We want to Velcro you to God, to the gospel, and we want to Velcro you to others. I love this beautiful picture of the local gathering of the churches. Again, there's kind of this big C church, everyone that professes Christ, this global church, and then there's these small local gatherings that we call local churches. And I love the beautiful picture of the local gathering, how People from all seasons, all walks of life, all life experiences, they come together to do life. We do life together in Jesus through a gospel lens. 
I was saying to the, the worship team this morning in our meeting before, like just the, we were just thinking about the, the worship team, like what a diversity of people that make up our band and our worship team. And to be honest with you, outside of Jesus and outside of City Church, most of them, their lives would never cross paths. There's people in our group that their personalities are the exact opposite. Their personalities are different. Uh, they have different preferences. They have different tastes. And to be honest, outside of Jesus, they probably would not hang out together outside of church. Multiply that by how many that sit in our seats every week. Now, most of the people sitting in this room each Sunday, each month, our lives would never cross outside of the gospel of Jesus. Like the, the, the reality is there are people in this room that you would not like outside of Jesus, that you would not want to hang out with. I might be one of them, right? There are people that we just wouldn't get along or we wouldn't have preferences that are the same. We prefer different things or we live in different areas. And yet it is the beautiful imagery of the gospel that there are people in this room from all seasons of life and walks of life and all types of life experiences that come and sit together and gather together and worship together and serve together and do small groups together and give together and take communion together and sing together and hang out together. And we do all those things for one reason, because we're united by the gospel of Jesus. What a beautiful picture that is, that we're learning from all different types of people and growing together from all different seasons of life. I love that City Church is a church that's filled with people of all different seasons of life. We have older people, we have younger people, we have middle-aged people, we have kids, right? When you go to a lot of churches and see a lot of churches, it's missing that. I've had pastor churches in my past that was like 95% people that were 40 or under, right? It was all young people. We have a lot of seasoned people in our church. Notice that kind expression, seasoned people in our church. Uh, people that have been on the journey for a minute. How many of you qualify as seasoned today? Um, the City Church has this diversity of people, right? What a great way to build community. So what are just the practical ways that I can build community? Again, we want smaller gatherings. We have city groups that provide this. We have serving teams. And then we have larger gatherings like this where we hear God's word, we sing together, we do communion together with others on the journey. Uh, one of the best things about small groups, I call it the ABCs of small groups, um, it, it gives you these things that we all need. It gives us accountability. We invite other people to speak into our life, to encourage us. Um, to, to be present in our lives. It gives us a place of belonging, that we a place to belong to other people, to be accepted, to be real, to be around other broken people. One thing I love about City Church, you sit in our small groups, you can be transparent, you can be real, because you're probably sitting around somebody else that's just as broken or more broken than you are. A place to belong. And then that C is to be able to care, to help take care of each other, to pray for one another, meet each other's needs, to serve together, to process through things as life brings us obstacles in our path. At some point in your spiritual journey, you will need other people. And that is only, only going to happen if you have developed relationships with other Jesus followers, if you have fostered that. I've used this illustration before. I'll use it again. I want people in my life who are pulling me along, encouraging me, pulling me along. I also want to be someone who is pulling others along. I want to be someone who is being pulled, being stretched, right, growing because other people are speaking to my life and they're holding me accountable and lifting me up and encouraging me and saying, Devin, how are things going? How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you? I know you're going through a hard time. Let me pray for you and lift you up. I need those people in my life. I also need to be the person in other people's lives who are saying that, doing that, encouraging them being pulled along and pulling others along. So I encourage you, be intentional in your community. Attend, be a part, invest in our large group, right? Your time, your treasures, your talents. Join a smaller group, a serving team. Serve alongside other people. Hang out together. I'm really about to stretch you. Don't be afraid. Don't be freaked out. Invite someone over. 
Devin, have you seen my house? Invite someone over. Don't want to take them to your house? How about coffee? How about, hey, let's meet at the park, let our kids play together. Hey, let's go uh, fish. Let's go do something. Point being, foster relationships. Develop relationships. I want to challenge you, City Church. If you can't remember the last time that you spent time with another City Church person outside of your family or closest friends that you probably already knew before you got here, if you can't think of a time that you have spent intentional time with someone outside of the walls of this building, outside of one of our small groups, if you can't think of a time that you've done that, you're not being fully intentional in your community. Right? You're going to have to step out there. You have to take that step, right? Realize there's other people on the journey with you. That's being intentional in our community. Because at some point, you're going to need someone. You're going to need people. And if you have not fostered those relationships, you're missing the bigger picture. So what is the goal in all this? What is the goal of living intentionally in community? Right back to our mission statement. To continue what Jesus began. And when Jesus left us with the Great Commission, when he left us with the gospel and said, go into all the world and proclaim this message, make disciples of all the nations. Guess what he was doing? He was putting us on mission together. He didn't stand before a single individual and say, this is on you, go make it happen. He stood before a group of people. And if you know their backgrounds, you know their histories, even if you know their recent history when Jesus died and came back, right? Even their recent history. Again, I've said it was kind of, it's kind of this ironic thing that we, there's no plan B with God. The church is it. Like we were left with this commission. Like have you seen us? Like this is it. The, the church, followers of Jesus, were left with this commission. That's God's plan from day one. Be on mission together. P.S., by the way, Jesus surrounded himself with others, with other people. Were they flawed? (laughs) Have you read the story? Were they broken? Man, you know even who Jesus' closest friends were, how broken, messed up people they were. And yet Jesus chose to be intentional in community his relationship with the Father, his relationship with others on earth. He is the head of our church. He is the leader of our church. The church belongs to Jesus. We follow his example by surrounding ourselves with other Jesus followers. This principle, and we're done. One of the things that Levi and I enjoy doing together um, is Legos, um, and so sometimes more challenging than others. But one thing I've learned and that you know about Legos without having to explain a lot is there are just single Lego blocks, bricks they call them, um, that don't mean a lot by themselves. It's one Lego brick. I can't do a lot with this kind of. I can carry it around in my pocket. I can set it on my shelf. It doesn't really mean anything. I can throw it in the bucket with the 10,000 other Legos, and it doesn't really mean anything. One Lego by itself doesn't mean a lot. But when you take a group of Legos and you begin to follow the instructions and piece them together and put them together and put the pieces where they belong and craft something over, sometimes a short amount of time, sometimes hours of time, sometimes days of time, based on the complexity of the Lego, each individual piece begins to find a place and a space into a bigger picture, into a bigger project, into a bigger, in this case, monster truck. Levi and I right now are trying to put together all the Power Jam uh, monster truck series of Legos because it's got kinetics, which means you can pull this back and it rolls by itself, without any kind of motor or anything. It's just the type of Lego that's in it. And so we decided, as uh, he and I, one of our projects is, let's get all the monster truck, uh, monster jam 
Lego sets and put them all together, all the trucks. And so this is a um, Megadon monster truck. And this is a conglomeration. This is um, a bunch of these put together into this. There's a big difference in this and this. This is the result of all of these being put together. Did you know sitting in our seats every week are a bunch of individual Lego pieces? If we're trying to follow Christ on our own and do it on our own and not involving our lives with a lot of people, then you can be a Lego piece, but honestly, it's not going to accomplish a ton because that's not not how God designed and created us. God designed for all of us Lego pieces to come together to form a body. In all these little sea gathering churches that are global, there's some of them that are massive Lego pieces, right? They have 10,000 pieces that come together to form that church. Um, our local gathering is not that. It's not a mega church. It's not a mega Lego, right? It's, it's, a, it's this group of people right here, that all of us, this whatever, 150, 200 people they call City Church at home, that they come together and they form all these pieces together that make up City Church. And we can't do a lot individually But as a group of that many Lego pieces that come together, guess what? We can continue what Jesus began by living intentionally in community. Would you join me on that journey? Let's bow our heads for prayer.